Christina, thanks LMB. Um, there's a couple of uh, Gompa folks here too, who you can't see, but uh, they're joining you. And um, I'm really glad that y'all are back. And um, if any of you who are non-video likers, if you don't mind popping your screen on just so there's a feeling of togetherness. It's nice to see your little cube faces, but um, if you're feeling uh, tired or you're feeling a bit vulnerable or your internet is just really dodgy, don't worry, you can leave it off if you need to. So um, will can you all hear me okay? Is the internet connection okay? Yeah, okay, excellent, excellent. So we'll start with setting our motivation. <sighs> okay, so just take a minute and connect with refuge in bodhicitta. Janju Padu Dani Kapsuchi Dagi Chunyan Gipe Sonam Ki Roll up and cheer Sange Drupa Show. All sentient beings, who although self and all appearances are Dharma Datu by nature, have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. Okay. So we left off last time with looking at the three levels of dependent arising and looking at the object of negation. That was kind of our main topics that we were looking at. And the reason we were looking at those is those are the ways in which we can actually realize emptiness directly. We need to have those preliminary understandings to access this incredibly profound view. Why do we need this, this profound view? Because understanding emptiness and then realizing it directly cuts the root of samsara. So to cut the root of samsara, you know, we have to understand what perpetuates it and what started it, even though there is really no start. <laughs> Right, beginningless time, beginningless mind, beginningless ignorance, beginningless Buddha nature, beginningless clear and knowing consciousness, all beginningless, but not all of that is endless, right? The suffering and the ignorance can end. You want to end the suffering, you need to end the ignorance. How do you do that? What are we ignorant of? We're ignorant of the fact that we are infinitely interconnected. We view the self in our own mental continuum, and then we hold it to exist inherently. We superimpose qualities above and beyond what is actually there. So if we just saw the conventional eye and we're like, oh yeah, just merely labeled by the mind, conventional eye, sure. We wouldn't get into all of this trouble so much, but we superimpose inherence on top of that which makes us have this illusion of solidness, of separateness, and a habit of dualistic thinking. Self and others, us and them, just is our natural default way of being. Everything splits into two, splits into two, splits into two, and not just this splitting, this kind of fabricated splitting, but also a belief that that's inherently the case, not just a mental fabrication. You know, it seems very definite that I am separate from you. Yeah, it seems very different. It seems very obvious that we are separate from our environment. 
It seems very much that our thoughts are separate from one another's. And it's not to say we all blur and merge because it's not like that, but we are so influencing constantly that it's much more akin to, I am like one hand and you are like another hand and it's all connected in this system. So if one part of the body is healthy, that brings power, strength, vitality to the rest of the body. If one part of the body is sick and unwell, that has an influence on the rest of the body's health and well-being. So if we can start to view each other in this way, it's closer to truth. It's closer to truth. And emptiness is a negation. So it's kind of hard for us to touch what exactly is being meant. What aren't we? <laughs> what isn't things? Without implying anything in its place, it's really hard to wrap our minds around which is why we talk about the illusory self, see that it's not there at all, or we look at dependent arising and see the way in which, or in the why in which things are empty. So when we were talking yesterday, do you remember kind of those three types of looking at dependent arising, what they were in any order? <laughs> what are things dependent on? Yeah, all things are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. What do they dependently ri arise in relation to or on? Yeah, go ahead. This might be two, but I think one of the answers is uh, causes and conditions. Yep, yep, exactly. Causes and conditions. Yep, all impermanent phenomena depend upon causes and conditions. A substantial cause, the main thing, the coactive conditions, that which kind of germinate and water that seed. Absolutely everything that changes moment to moment or is produced needs causes and conditions. Can't just come out of nowhere. Flowers don't just have bloom, they grow into blooming, right? Things don't just come out of the earth with no reason, there's a seed first. And the seed isn't enough, there needs watering and sunshine and all of those things. And so too, the inner world is like the outer world. Yeah. So that, that's one way to help us break the spell, the illusion of things being inherent. Um, do you remember the other forms of dependent arising, anybody? Dependent upon, hmm? then. <laughs> Parts. Parts. Yep, 100% parts. Yep, parts and whole or context, right? For something to be labeled as something, there needs to be parts. For something to say, I am parts of something, there has to be a something, <laughs> right? Or you can think of it more in terms of context if that helps. It's all kind of related on that level. So you can think, um, near and far only exist in relation to one another. Yeah, or like large and small only exist in relation to one another, which stays all kind of abstract, but then what are we, what about good and bad? What about healthy and unhealthy? What about needed or unneeded? Then that becomes an interesting conversation. You know, you start to say, these are the things I need for my health and well being, as if that's just solidly the case, divorced from context. Yeah. It's like, perhaps you've grown to assume these are the things that are needed for health and well-being, And then the other ones are conventionally true and you don't have to mess with them, but you still know that they're not self-existent. You know, there's a lot of layers to kind of dig through. Yeah. It's not just thinking on the level of opinion. Like you could see the cup and say, that's a cup, everyone agrees, that's a worldly convention. It's a cup dependent upon causes and conditions and parts. But it being a beautiful cup or an ugly cup, my cup or your cup, is almost another layer of coarseness on top. And so we barely ever even touch that subtler level of dependent arising. We just kind of live in our opinions, which are even more coarse. <laughs> and assume that's true. Like everyone agrees this is a very ugly cup. Everyone agrees this is a very beautiful cup. 
where if Yuntin is holding it, it must be hers. That's just obvious. And none of that is problematic until you start talking about land <laughs> or water or people's romantic partners or, you know, et cetera. Then it starts getting really confronting and you can go to crazy town and say, oh, them being so-and-so's partner, that's just an opinion. That's just a surface truth. It's not even a relative truth. It's all a construct, a social construct. So of course I can steal their partner, <laughs> right? It can just like go veer off into the deep end, totally missing ethics, totally missing the point of Buddhism being to develop compassion and loving kindness and all of those really rich, deep and loving qualities. You can fall into a slippery slope that is actually missing the middle way. Yeah, and, and we can do this when we're taking too many shortcuts with philosophy and say, oh, it's a matter of opinion, as if that means it doesn't matter or that there isn't anything at all to land on. When there is something to land on, it's just gotta be gently. Yeah, and to ask, what does honoring convention do from my forward momentum on the spiritual path. Which conventions need to be honored while still seeing them as conventions? Which ones can I let go of completely? Yeah, and these are really personal questions, right? Like think of something like beauty, right? Letting go of lots of conventions about beauty or handsomeness or you know whatever, those kind of like surface things, that could really free you up. So you know that the rest of the world has a whole kind of standard. And so perhaps you've gotten rid of conventions so much so that you're not bathing quite enough, right? Anyone at a Dharma center, that's, that can happen, right? That they're getting rid of convention. And so then there's not as much bathing. <laughs> you want to say, perhaps we don't need to bathe as much as we do, but there's a societal convention that this level of body odor is acceptable. This level is unacceptable. So we just kind of like buy into it for the sake of others while still knowing it's contextual, right? But something like beauty, you might say, all right, what is my valuing of beauty about? Do I think of it as a gateway to kindness or to respect? Do I use it as a way to manipulate others? Or is it something that I like to share to make other people happy? You know, I'm going to wear a pretty shirt today with nice flowers on it or a really vibrant blue because that's gonna make people kind of lift their spirits. You know, what are our reasons for valuing aesthetics? You know, so it's all very surface stuff, but it, it is our life. And this is what we're thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis of I'm making this, this, and this choice because I want to be happy. And I'm assuming that those choices are the ingredients for my happiness, very rarely challenging them. You know, so just because it's convention doesn't mean that you throw it away, but just because it's convention also, you know that there's a deceptive quality just by its very nature. Yeah. So then what was the last level of dependent arising? Do you remember the subtlest one? labels yeah yeah that all things are dependent upon mere designation or labeling on a valid basis and that's the subtlest one and that's the trickiest one yeah so the more you get used to the language of this then when you meet philosophy classes and they're throwing these terms around you can start to really dig into the depths of what is meant by the term rather than just trying to get your head around vocabulary so some of the technical terms in Buddhism, you don't really need to know them for your daily practice, but the nuances of dependent arising, I would get your head around them. They're gonna just keep coming up. And so that, those are useful ones to kind of get yourself memorized. The concept of the object of negation is another one. So when I say to you, find the object of negation or confront the object of negation, or to see the object of negation is to find the false self. What does that mean? What's the connotation of that? What is this troublemaker or this pretender? What is the illusion? Or like, what's the lie? Does that one need a bit more unpacking or are you remembering? It's not who we are. 
It's not who we are. How does it seem to be? That it is. That it is. In what way? I'm looking for a certain word. Okay. <laughs> a certain word. But me out, group. <laughs> you're going in the right direction, though. You're going in the right direction. Right. Is it um, things appear permanent? That's a, like a side effect. <laughs> Definitely. That's a side effect, permanence. So the self appears permanent. That's a problematic side effect of the main problem. But what's the main problem? Yep, yep. John has just wrote in the chat, inherently existent, right? So the self really, the inherently existent self, there's no such thing. But the inherently existent self is the one we identify with. So the one that thinks this is just who I am or the one that thinks everything good about me, everything bad about me is me, right? That all of my defining characteristics, my ethnicity, my gender, my level of intelligence, my level of, I don't know, emotional maturity, my physical health, my whatever, whatever, all of these kind of attributes are somehow core features of selfness that we either own or created or gathered to some core, some hard core, not a, not a, you know, empty core, but like a hard core that we've like built upon. And certainly a side effect of believing that the self is inherently existent is thinking that it's permanent or non-changing. Yeah, but that's, you know, that's a coarser kind of a problem, like part of the problem of thinking that we're permanent is that despite intellectually knowing we're going to die, experientially, we're really in denial, right? If we really understood the way the self is changing moment to moment and that this particular body is going to stop supporting consciousness, we would live very differently. So we all know we're going to die, but we don't really believe it. And we don't really believe it could happen at any time. You know, despite the fact that many people our exact age have died at this exact age, that many people at our exact level of health right now have died. Yeah, that, you know, young people die before old people every day, healthy people die before sick people every day, that there is no guarantee whatsoever. We have no idea what's lurking. Yet we still are kind of like, oh, I'm going to die old and in my sleep, quietly and peacefully with no fuss, having addressed all of my family dramas, forgiven who I need to forgive, asked forgiveness of who I need to ask forgiveness of, distributed my belongings with care and mindfulness to appropriate charities and family members, the pets will have excellent owners to go to, done, 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 we like we assume it's going to be all nice and tidy when we could just be like in the shower, have a heart attack, poof, you know? And then we're like in the shower, inelegantly covered in soap, you know? Someone finds us and they're like, oh, that's embarrassing. And also you're dead, yikes. You know, like it's not gonna be tidy necessarily. Quite often it's not. So if we didn't believe that the self was inherently existent, we probably wouldn't also grasp at a sense of permanence about it. That's certainly true like Eve was saying, but it's, it's more than that. There's this sense of inherently existent I that makes you feel different and separate from other people such to the degree that you're really sure that some people help in the self. So you must cling to them and pull them closer. And that some people hurt and threaten the self and you must push them away and get them far away from you which has got some conventional wisdom. You know, you don't have to throw out your common sense, but it's not so simple as that, right? It's not so simple as that, that your experience of harm is contextual. You know, people that have had like a really, really rough life with a lot of, you know, chaos and a lot of uncertainty, then if they're in a position that has relative stability, and there's some like difficult person in their life, it just doesn't get to them. They're like, if you saw what I saw, this wouldn't get to you either. But maybe if you'd lived a very, you know, sweet and sheltered life with a lot of resources and support and stability, 
then the first difficult character in your life throws you for six and you're just absolutely out to sea. You don't know how to cope. So it's not like the difficult person made you feel a certain way. It was all of the things leading up to that moment and then how you chose to view it, which we kind of probably already knew before we even met Buddhism, right? Part of you already knew, but the point of kind of coming back to what is this false self is that it slips through our fingers as soon as we stop looking at it. And we once again reinforce the belief that our self and everything else exists from its own side or by way of its own characteristics, somehow self-created and that our opinions are true and solid, divorced from context and that they don't change probably either. Yeah, so it's one of those things like death that despite knowing better, we have to like remember on purpose what is true so often that it starts to dissolve our knee jerk appearances or adherence to appearances in any case. Yeah, again and again and again. Yeah, so any questions about dependent arising before we kind of head back to the text? Or thoughts you had? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, wait. so my question is, you know, listening to what you were just sharing with us about how we need to come back to these teachings time and time again, so we don't kind of slip back into our old ways, our habitual ways of seeing ourselves in the world around us. It just makes me wish, and I'm wondering if there honestly is a technique you know, if there was like some sort of like test we could take, like a written exam that puts us like on a scale. So we know like how much we need to practice or, you know, like the more effective ways of practicing to wake us up to these habits. And so like, okay, yeah, that I'm sure that doesn't e exist, but I'm honestly wondering, you know, within the canon of Buddhism, if there are ways that we can not just see that we're in these habits, but kind of gauge like how severely attached we are to them. So we can have a general idea of how we're doing. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot of mind training slogans like in the seven point mind training that kind of reference symptoms of self-cherishing and self-grasping ignorance. And okay. one of them is if you can practice during times of stress, you are well-trained. Okay, I you feel know? like I've heard that before. Okay. Yeah, so that's, you know, it's a classic Geshe Chikawa seven point mind training. One of the sub points is really asking yourself the last time there was crisis, mm -hmm. did you rise to it or crumple from it? And what type of crisis do you really feel there's a, a strength that you've built that you can meet it with some kind of grace? And what kind of stressors do you know that given enough time or pressure, you're going to crumple sure. uh, or get aggressive, right? And so it's not about identifying as, oh, I'm a strong person. I'm good in a crisis. It's about really recognizing yeah. what is it that makes you crack under pressure? Uh -huh. Yeah. And is it more related to things that are anger triggers or attachment triggers or ignorance triggers? And just kind of working on mm -hmm. those because in a quiet life surrounded by people you chose, there's some stress, but as soon as you're around things you didn't choose or things that really interfere with your peace, then you see where you're actually at. Okay. It's, hard to, it's harder to gauge yourself in an ordinary day. It's yeah. easier to gauge yourself referencing the last time there was a lot of stress. Okay. Yeah. So Good that's, to see that's one way. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Great. Very helpful. Yeah, slowly, slowly. So this, this false self, you know, and I have to always, re, you know, remind myself and remind everyone else, there is a self, right? There is a self that is relatively existent. That self is just that which is merely labeled by the mind on the collection of aggregates. So the name you wonk onto the body and mind, basically. There's a body which has many parts. There's a mind which has many parts. The body and the mind are interdependent with each other and with the environment and with their karma and a million different things. But you could kind of draw an outline around it and say, it's got that name. And that's fine, as long as you just leave it at that. That can be the self, that's the relative self. Kind of put a label on this area here. 
you know, just like when you look at a map, you draw a boundary around some random bit of land and said, let's call it California. You know, it's like, it's not inherently California. It wasn't always California, but we could draw a line around it and say, that's what it is, <laughs> right? And people will say, oh, okay, sure. We'll call it that. But you could just as easily draw a different line and a different thing and call it a different name. You know, it's not like a self, it's not like that area of land told us all to call it that, right? But it feels that way sometimes, you know? I, I was thinking about this on the road trip here because you're going through these different states and you're wanting to feel like a visceral different state to state, <laughs> you know? So I went from Montana to Idaho and it's like, yeah, they're the same. <laughs> Right. And then you get into Nevada and it's like, okay, Nevada is pretty dry and there's a lot of casinos. So, you know, there's a difference, but it's gradual. Right. And then you get into California and there's lots more trees and it's a bit more, ah, oh, but then the traffic, you know, so there's like things that you can say that are like characteristics of those areas, but it's not like those characteristics don't exist in other places or at other times, you know, they're not like fundamental Nevada-ness, like a casino and a desert is not inherently a Nevada-ness. It's just a common thing to see there, right? You know what I mean? So the inherently existent self is what feels like the one that says, I am inherently this all by myself. Yeah, like the one that says, I am California before you even drew the line around me. Yeah, that these, these trees and these roads and these people make me this or I made them this. It's like this add-on or this facade. Yeah, do you sort of feel the difference, right? So there's the, let's call it this, and that works. And then there's the extra add-on of it is inherently this. And that's the object of negation. So when we look at the self, it feels like, you know, the object of negation feels like the one that has always been the voice in your head. It feels like the one that thinks about things a certain way. It feels like the one who needs to be protected or elevated. So you have to find that, that sense, right? And then you ask yourself, well, if it's the voice in my head, what about before I had words, <laughs> right? If it's the things I say to myself, which ones specifically? Have I had the same exact train of thought since I began to have words in my head, et cetera, right? And you see how it starts to kind of fall apart. Yeah, but you have to get it to rise up. Okay, so back to the verses. Um, his Holiness in his commentary on this text, he references Arya Deva's 400 stanzas, which says, just as the physical faculty permeates all other faculties, likewise ignorance permeates all other mental afflictions. And this can be overcome by understanding dependent origination or dependent arising. Therefore, anyone wanting to understand the teaching of the Buddha must be taught dependent or origination first at the outset. So we want to be looking at the way in which things depend, causes and conditions, parts and whole and context, merely labeled by the mind on a valid basis, that all of these things really make sense scientifically and logically to prove that nothing stands alone. If you understand this well, then you can start to use words like emptiness, and it's not going to send you into nihilism. You can say things are empty, because they depend. They're empty of inherence, because the opposite of inherence is dependence. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so dependence is easier to access because it's a somethingness rather than a not somethingness. Yeah, we can get our head around it. Okay, so going back to verse nine, um, it said, Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti set their instructions upon the wind and Manjushri Garba conveyed these to us by Burj. So I hope to see my ever present old mother without hardship of a prolonged search. 
So again, this is reminding us that this particular teaching, these particular verses have been explained and clarified by many practitioner scholars in previous years, that this isn't the first time wisdom has been revealed. It's not the last time wisdom will be, be revealed either. But we can really go much more efficiently and quickly because these previous scholars tidied things up and kind of made the, made the Buddha's teachings more accessible or more elaborated so that when we sit, we don't have as much work to do. During the time of the Buddha, he taught to who was in front of him at the level that they needed. So it's not like he, at the beginning of his life as an enlightened being, taught the beginning, and then in his middle age, he taught the middle, and then in his old age, he taught the end. Sometimes he taught the middle, sometimes the end, sometimes the beginning, all out of order because he was teaching who was in front of him based on what they needed. Which means once he died and the, you know, the assembly came together to write down the teachings and get everything pieced together, they had to figure out how to put it in order and which teachings were for which audience. There is a lot of work to be done and mistakes can be made by people who themselves don't have realizations. So they would get messy, you know, human beings, right? They do their best, but they're going to misinterpret. But then we've had subsequent Buddhas like Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, Manjushri Garbo, which is a reference to Lama Tsongkhapa. And they tidied it up again and said, here's what the Buddha said specifically for this audience, do this. And so it's really um, a great, uh, I guess, a great benefit that we've had these teachers since the Buddha. So His Holiness quoted particularly from Chandrakirti. And he ch quoted Chandrakirti who said, through the illuminating light of wisdom, as clear as a myrobalan fruit held in his own hand, he realizes the three worlds as originally uncreated through conventional truth proceeds to cessation. And through conventional truth proceeds to cessation. So he's pointing to the solution to suffering being within our own hands. So this fruit that's referenced in the poetry, this is just a medicinal fruit. And the thing that's going to lead to a cessation or finishing suffering is the wisdom that comes from our own messy, conventional, problematic mind it can still touch wisdom and develop wisdom. We don't have to go anywhere else. It's like the medicine's already in our hand. And then another verse he quoted was, spreading his broad wings of the truths of concealment and suchness, leading the swans of ordinary individuals, this king of swans, soars ahead on the strong winds of virtue and proceeds to the supreme far shore of the victorious one's qualities. So the truths of concealment and suchness are relative truth, which is deceptive, and suchness is ultimate truth, which is accurate, which is reality. So these two wings, even though relative truth conceals or deceives or isn't accurate, it's what we know and what we're working with. So it leads to the method side of the path. Suchness or emptiness, ultimate truth, is actual reality. To access it, we need the wisdom that realizes that reality. So these two wings of us ordinary people lead us to the final goal. And the strong winds of virtue are basically just mental momentum, right? We're not talking about virtue like being a good girl or being a good boy. We're talking about the strong winds of virtue being mental merit. So it's just this repetitive, accessing of your own wisdom, practicing of your own method again and again, which creates a momentum. So they complement each other, then you'll be able to reach Buddhahood, at which stage you would have overcome all the defilements in one's mind, both afflictive and cognitive obscurations. So then going back to verse 10, there seem to be among today's scholars, some caught in a web of words, like thoroughly withstanding and true existence, who seek only to negate some creature with horns, while leaving intact this everyday appearance of solidity. So there's a mistake that philosophers make, um, that we make even to this day, which is 
to negate or cancel only the non-existent, but then li leave alone the everyday appearance of solidity or the everyday appearance of inherence. So we need to access the object of negation and to negate it, but we also need to take it steps further, not just leave it at that. So this creature with horns being like the horns of a rabbit, which don't exist at all, just like the object of negation does not exist at all. If you only negate that, but don't go any further, it's not enough. So yesterday we just did the point one, which is really vital, but is not the whole story. So we'll look at the other ones and then we'll do the meditation on it. So verse 11 says, but such vivid duality is not found on my mother's unveiled face, I believe. From protracted discussions missing the point, my old mother is liable to flee. So old mother remembering that is a reference to emptiness, you know, the sort of womb-like space of infinite possibility, the mother in this context being emptiness. If you do these protracted discussions missing the point, the fact of emptiness is gonna leave your mind, you're gonna miss it. So this vivid duality is not found on your mother's unveiled face. So we're seeking to see the unveiled face of emptiness and not buy into the duality, which is what we see generally speaking. Okay, so just reviewing to recognize the object to be negated, we find the inherently existent self by provoking it back into prominence through imagination and memory. And then what? Then we have to ascertain the two possibilities of oneness and difference of the self and the aggregates. So basically what you're saying is, I'm not gonna challenge the premise that the self inherently exists yet. Even though I know I'm going to, there is no inherently existent self, my whole life and lifetimes, I've 100% believed it was the case. I can't just overcome that by going, oh, okay. I have to look at the, the false logic I've been holding on to. So you say, if the self did inherently exist, it could only exist in one of two ways, either one with its parts or the same as its parts or different to its parts or separate from its parts. Yeah, those are the only two ways an inherently existent self could exist. So you're not challenging that or exploring those yet. You're just sitting with the logic of if it is just as it seems to be, those are the options. Yeah, so if there is an inherent me, I'm either the same as my parts or different to them. So what are the parts? And then you see the way in which each of those parts depend. So self and aggregates. Okay, aggregates are the components that we label self on. So if self was more than that, then we should be able to find it. So you first look form, okay, the body. If the body is the self or isn't the self is the question. Is the body the self? Isn't the body the self? Then you do that the same process for is the self feeling? And this is where it gets a bit more subtle and into your daily life because it often feels like you are your feelings or you are the way that you feel or the way that you experience and describe feelings to yourself that that is the core of you, how you experience pleasant, unpleasant or neutral or emotions in general, that really feels like it either is the self or the self owns that. That's the way it feels, right? And if you're kind of, you know, settled a bit, you might think, okay, feelings are a conditioned response based on what? Oh, what I see and describe to myself, the story I tell myself. So it must be the mental factor of discrimination or recognition. Yeah, and you think, okay, okay, feelings dependently arise, the body dependently arises, I must be my labeler, yeah? This is good, so I feel good. This is bad, so I feel bad. The I is the composer of the internal narrative, or the I is the one that describes or sees. And so that, you know, you just kind of let it be like, yeah, okay, the self either is that or owns that. It feels like that could be the case. And then you realize, okay, discrimination is based on what? 
what you're in front of, what you've been taught to say that it is, how you were feeling a moment before you saw it or felt it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Discrimination doesn't stand alone. So then I must be the compositional factors, all the other mental factors, or I must own them. And so you just pick one like intention, because that's a really strong one. Intention is what moves the mind towards or away from certain thoughts, ideas, or choices. The movement of the mind, intention. So before you even feel or describe there is movement towards or away, or after you feel and describe, you move towards and away. Okay, whatever that movement is, the one who decides to move, whether internally or externally, that's the self, okay. Or the self owns that. Yeah, and you kind of sit there, yeah, that could be it. And then you think, oh, okay, intention is what? It's a conditioned response. It's related to what came before. It, it's related to a million conditions in front. It's related, 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 related. I didn't make it or decide it or create it or drive it. It's a coming together of stimuli related to my other internal stimuli as well as external stimuli. So, okay, I must then be consciousness itself, primary minds, maybe primary mental consciousness. That one is the easiest place to think it either is the self or the self owns it. Yeah, that the mind is the self. That really feels like, okay, I've gotten to the subtlest, that must be it. So just sit with that, what is the mind? That which is clear and knowing, what does that mean? Clarity, so like reflectiveness, and knowing the ability to reflect. So like a clear mountain lake, think of the mind like a clear mountain lake. So in order to be reflective, in order to hold objects, in order to do anything, there has to be an object. There is no mind without an object. That's interesting. So already the mind is dependent upon something and the experience of the mind is dependent upon something. So does the self carry the consciousness? Does it drive the consciousness? Is it like merged with it? What is it exactly? And you're starting to see, okay, no, the consciousness experience is related very much to the mental factors experience related to the body's experience it's all interwoven outside inside etc cetera, etc cetera. okay so i really do see the way it feels like there are two possibilities for an inherently existent self but i'm already starting to doubt that either one of them is possible probably neither way is possible but let's just still assume they might be because again, beginningless time, beginningless mind, we've believed in inherently existent self for so long to just kind of like punch a hole through the facade, it's just gonna close right up again. It's not gonna work. So we have to gently logic ourselves. Yeah, so in order to do that, um, we're gonna look at this book from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, How to See Yourself as You Really Are. Um, I really recommend this book. Um, chapter 16, determining the choices is what we're going to look at. Um, and we're just going to do this like a meditative reflection. So it's not like a full fledged analytical meditation. It's more like you're just going to reflect on what is read to you and see how it lands. And then we'll do the full meditation version after the little break. Are you up for it? Yeah, just, so you can read on the screen if you're a visual person who likes to read, but if you'd prefer just having your eyes closed and just listening, that's totally fine too. Yeah, so get yourself kind of a ready to absorb <laughs> um, written content vibe. Yeah, and uh, don't feel like you need to take notes because it's in a book and you can just look at the book <laughs> some other time. Okay, so it starts with a quote. When phenomena are individually analyzed as selfless, and what has been analyzed is meditated upon, that is the cause for attaining the fruit, nirvana. One does not go to peace through any other cause. 
Buddha. In the first step, you figured out how you appear to your mind. This realization was necessary because if you do not get a sense of what inherent existence is, no matter how much you might talk about selflessness or emptiness, it would just be words. After you have identified the sense that objects exist from power within themselves, then when you study about and meditate on selflessness and emptiness, the way is open for some understanding of the ab absence of over-concretized existence to dawn to your mind. However, without knowing how objects appear to have such a status and how you assent to it, you might, not have, the, you might have the impression that the great treatises on emptiness are just trying to force us to accept what they are saying. Therefore, keep coming back to the first step, since as your knowledge deepens, your estimation of the target being investigated will become more and more subtle. So he's reminding us about that first step, recognizing the object of negation. Then the second step is limiting the possibilities. Now you need to establish a logical structure for the subsequent analysis. In general, anything that you take to mind has to be either one or more than one, singular or plural. For instance, it is obvious that a stone pillar and an iron pot are plural. A bowl is one thing, singular. Because this is the case, what is inherently established must also be either one entity or different entities. There is no other possibility. This means that if the I inherently exists, it must be either one with the mind and body or entirely different from the mind and body. You need to ponder these parameters. They are the context for examining in the last two steps, whether the target that you identified in the first step really does exist so concretely. If it does, it should be able to withstand this analysis. And so analyze whether the I that is inherently self-established in the context of the mind-body complex could have a way of existing other than being part of or separate from mind and body. Is there another possibility? Take other phenomena, such as a cup and a table, or a house and a mountain as examples. See that there is no third category of existence. They are either the same or different. Decide that if the I inherently exists as it seems to, be either one with or separate from the mind and body. Just explore if that makes sense to you. Okay, so that idea that the relationship of the self with the body and mind 
is either a relationship of they're the same thing or they're completely different things. Does that work? It's either one or the other if it is inherent. and relax your attention. Okay. So we'll have um, a five minute break. So have a little stretch and a refresh, and then we'll come back and look at those other two points and do a, and then do the full meditation. So um, just kind of mull it over and have a stretch and I'll see you in five minutes.
Okay, come on back. Okay. So, are there other possibilities? <laughs> right? Are there other possibilities with your relationship with if there's an inherent, inherently existent self? It's got to be one or the other. One with or separate from all the bits and pieces, the body and mind. Is there a third possibility? Did you have a qualm arise? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I had this idea that what if, what if the third possibility is something more like the idea we have of the self, like we have like definitions for like what makes up a table, right? So it's like, we might not have one right in front of us, but we have this general set of requirements. Mm -hmm. What about that? Yeah, exactly. And that's the direction. That's the direction that we're going to for sure. Yeah. So it's good your mind is kind of organically going that direction because that's, uh, that's what starts to come to you is something so solid in a kind of ownership or slave dynamic with the body and mind that feels a bit too concrete, actually, upon assessment. But what does make more sense is to say, it's a concept. It's a concept or it's an idea. Yeah, that does make more sense. And it makes more sense talking, but we want it to make more sense thinking and then experiencing. So talking is where it's got to start, right? We need the conceptual mind to unpack it for sure. So yeah, you're going the right direction. <laughs> you're going the right direction. But if, you know, okay. and, and you know, it's again and again, it's like there's no inherently existent self but we think there is, so let's pretend that there is. We think there is, so let's pretend there is. If there is, can it exist any other way than one with or separate from its parts? Any other way? It's, and, you know, and hopefully the conclusion is like, no? <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, with a question cool. mark, right? <laughs> Yeah, so we're kind of, really talking about like the, the concept itself wouldn't count as a way of existing because it's not perceivable by <clears throat> something like our vision or sight or, or um, you know, well, our hearing or touch. It, it does uh, exist. It just exists nominally, right? It just exists mm -hmm. in mere name. So that's not like it doesn't exist. The self does exist in mere name. Oh, you know, sure. and, not the, and not just like floating in mere name, but like attributed to parts. The, the problem is that those parts take turns saying they're the boss or the self. You know, that's what happens. The, the, sure. the parts, you know, it's like the body feels like, no, I'm the self, especially like if you're yeah. really experiencing pleasure or pain, then the body is like, yeah, I'm the self. Everything else is a servant of the body yeah yeah no, true. sure sure right and then you realize okay no there's more going on and then you shift through them each so that's why you kind of do this exercise with looking at how each of the aggregates is dependently arisen because then none of them can really be an inherent boss they can just right. take turns having prominence mm -hmm. yeah and they kind of um and all of them together then get a name slapped on them but each yes. of those aggregates have aggregates it's not like saying aggregates are the end of the story. You know, right. aggregate is a weird word, right? Because we only ever use this word aggregates to describe what like piles of rocks that we use to like yeah. fill in foundations, right? Like aggregate is a weird word, right? Yeah, a pile like a Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> a pile <laughs> of stuff. So, you know, or the scandas, right? So the, the pile of stuff that we label self on, each of those piles have piles yes. or heat, you know? Sure, and that's sure. and that's what you kind of come to is like okay so there's a self but just a, kind of from a distance <laughs> the closer you get the more it dissolves into pieces which is not saying it dissolves into nothing right you know yeah for sure, for sure. yeah all right yeah, thank you so, yeah no totally totally and i think it'll be clearer you know when we go to the other two points i think that helps unpack okay. it um, 
So really, if, you know, if you guys ever want to get this book, it's such a good book, How to See Yourself as You Really Are, because he has these short little pithy reflections at the end of each verse, and you can just kind of sit with them in your room and really get some good work done. So if you don't have it already, this is an amazing book. Um, so, okay, so we just decided there are only two possibilities, either the self, the inherently existent self, the object to be negated, the problematic thing, if it's there, it's either one with or separate from, same or different than the aggregates. Okay, so let's look at the first one. How is it that there is a lack of oneness or sameness of the I and the aggregates? What's the fault in the logic? Yeah, what's the fault in the logic? If the I and the aggregates are the same thing, What's that mean? Yeah, what's that mean? Does it mean that each aggregate has an I? Like, you know, from a distance, there's like a herd of horses and they have a shape and you can say that herd of horses is called the Idaho herd of horses or the this and that mountain herd of horses. But each one is an individual horse with an individual self going with its individual choices, but it seems from a distance to have a shape and a name or like a school of fish or something. That's kind of the fallacy of this one is, is if the self is the same as the aggregates, because the aggregates are plural, then the self would have to be plural, right? That's, that's the absurd conclusion. Right. And I guess that begs the question, do we agree that there are many components happening here, <laughs> right? That the body has many components. That's easy because we've studied science, at least when we were kids. But does the mind have components? You know, do we, do we actually, are we on board with that? Or does the mind just feel like one big glunk thing it's just like the brain and it just processes physical things and that's what it does it's just one thing with many responses and activities but it's just one thing yeah or is the mind actually got more aspects to it that are related they are all of mind but are kind of definable in their jobs is feeling the same as discrimination you know, is intention the same as, I don't know, attention? Yeah. Is movement the same as focus? Is describing the same as experience? You know, we can put it in colloquial terms if the mind and mental factors vocabulary is kind of like takes a second to get your head around. You know what your mind is up to. Like in this moment, what is your mind doing? It's processing words and ideas. It's listening to sounds. It's trying to sit upright. There's probably some digestion happening in the body, right? Some sort of digestion happening. Um, you know, it's trying to regulate its temperature. So there's a lot going just physically, but then mentally, what the mind chooses to focus on and emphasize, it's not like it's always words or always feelings or always movement, is it? It's kind of like the different aspects take turns flaring into prominence doesn't it, right? Sometimes your feelings are a really big deal and sometimes they're not. You feel pleasant or unpleasant, but you're not like fussed about it, right? Sometimes you are, sometimes you feel pleasant or unpleasant and it's a huge deal, right? Amazing pleasure. I am this pleasure. I will merge with this pleasure. This is my, you know, human potential or this suffering is my suffering. I shall always be this suffering, you know, like, um, People who have depression don't usually say I have a depression, they say I'm depressed, like they are the feeling, right? So, you know, so it's, it's like these things take turns, so then they can't really be the same thing, can they? Because they have very different activities, even though they're interrelated and mutually dependent. So if the self were all of those components, components are many, so then self would have to be many. And that's weird and it makes no sense. <laughs> that's the conclusion we wanna to come to is that's weird and it makes no sense. But do you come to that conclusion or do you get hung up? You know, that's the question. Just cause you know what the answer should be doesn't mean you feel it, right? So where do you get stuck?
It's an interesting conversation, right? And, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, there's probably aggregates or parts or components that we more easily take ownership of and have an identity with and other parts that we say, oh, that's not really me. That's just something that happens on a bad day or that's not really me, you know, like I'm gonna lose weight soon. The body will look different. <laughs> this isn't really my body. When I lose 10 pounds, that'll be my body, right? <laughs> like those extra 10 pounds are not the self, but all of the other pounds are, right? Or like this trait and this trait, those are me. You know, those are really me. The loving kindness, the compassion, those are me. But you know, the anger and the jealousy, that's not really me. You know, in one sense, that's a good way to think because our Buddha nature is moving towards developing the good qualities and is moving towards getting rid of the negative qualities. But right now, the good stuff is all mixed with self-cherishing and the bad stuff is all mixed with potential to change it, right? So it's like, it's all just mind mess. <laughs> Why do some get more identity than others? Yeah, if the self were the aggregates, they would all, all of the aggregates would be the self has to go both ways but we very easily say that these bits me these bits not me yeah even like things we own like these clothes these clothes are really me those clothes those aren't me even though they're in my closet next to the other clothes that all I think of as me these shoes are me these are really me shoes right those other shoes that I got in the 80s those really aren't me <laughs> you know it's like why <laughs> you know but we can say that, you know, we do say that colloquially. So what you're trying to do, and because in our tradition, we're middle way consequentialists, theoretically, or we're middle way consequential, consequentialists in an aspirational way, is that we want to practice this coming to a certain consequence. So you take the reasoning that you have and you don't just leave it at that. You have to take it to its absurd conclusion, which makes you laugh yourself out of the faulty thinking. And this kind of logical exercise or this debate style is one of the most fun ways to get over your mess because you're not feeling like you're bad or deficient or stupid. You're just thinking, aren't human beings ridiculous? Aren't we ridiculous that we identify as this when this is no more us than that? Yeah. So you're trying to find the absurdity because if you can laugh yourself out of it, it's going to stick. The wisdom is going to stick. You know, I mean, think of all the classes you've had in your lifetime. Don't the ones you remember have some element of humor <laughs> or positive engagement? You know, there's something that made you remember it struck you in some way. So we're trying to make the teachings strike us in a way that it sticks. So coming to an absurd consequence is a really useful tool. So you come to, okay, one with or same as this one makes no sense. Okay, so then the only other option is if the I and the aggregates are totally separate and totally different from one another. Yeah, and you think, okay, that's the only other possibility. If I am a concrete, solid, identifiable I, I must be different than my parts. And some days that feels more true than others, right? So if the I were separate from the aggregates, what's an absurd consequence? You might have to mull it over before they jump out at you, but do you have any guesses? If the I is separate from its parts, then what happens? Yeah, go ahead, Andrea. Um, I think we could say that the aggregates are also separate from us, so they inherently exist. So now we have two things that are inherently existing and you can't say the self is the same as something else if it also inherently exists because they're inherently separate, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's a good one. That's excellent. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Okay. All right. I'm or like, yeah, right. No, you're going in the right way. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, Jana. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Is it Jana or Jana? I never know. Jana? Um, well, I go by Jay. Jay. Yeah. Cut all of the rest of it out. <laughs> Jay, what do you say? Um, well, I thought if the 
if if the body dies, if 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 J if the body dies, then there is no J that I label, you know, as that self. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If one of the aggregates dies, um, if the self is not the aggregates, then what? The self gets to go rogue from the body. It's like the body died, but the self's still there, so it gets to just kind of go rogue. What is it doing? It's absurd, right? It makes no sense. Right. Or um, what if, uh, I don't know, there's the body is still alive. There's still brain function, but there seems to be like vegetable brain function, you know, just like minimal waves. So, you know, the mind is not the brain, but the mind uses the brain. So if you had the body still existing there, but the mind's not operating, then still there could somehow be a self, right? Like hanging out on the body or hanging out, you know, walking around in the body, but not able to use, you know, it would be weird. It would, like, there's a whole other self unrelated to the mind, just kind of like doing what? Yeah. So, so the question becomes, is there anything that the body and the mind do that are not the self doing something? Right? Can you say my body is doing this, but my self is not? You can say I'm not present for it or I'm disassociated from it, sure. But like, is there an extra entity? Is there like, I don't know, are we like transformers or something? And there's like a little guy like in charge in the center of the robot, like pulling gears or like a spider in the web, you know? And like, we are the spider and our aggregates are the web. Like, that's weird, makes no sense, okay. But, you know, find somewhere where you get stuck, find somewhere where it's like, you know, sometimes people will say, if they, you know, have some Indian philosophy, what about Atman? Or if they have Christian background, what about the soul? And we would say, well, there's a consciousness that continues from life to life, that has continuity. The past has a relationship to the future. The future will have a relationship to the, or the present will have a relationship with the future. There's a continuity but it's an ever-changing continuity of consciousness. There's not like a core in the continuity that doesn't change ever, yeah? It's much more like a river, right? A river is changing moment to moment, but you can still give it a name. And when it crosses from one border to another, you might give it a different name. And you know what happened upstream has a relationship to what's happening downstream. But where do you point and say, there's the core of the river? You know, it doesn't make sense. But if the self was different to the aggregates, there'd be like an inherent riverness, you know, like a little sailor on top, you know, a little guy in a kayak who was the self that was somehow of the river, but different to the river, like in charge of the river, but some totally other substance. Yeah, it becomes absurd. Yeah, are you are you stuck anywhere though? It's like you know you know where this is going, but still like viscerally you're feeling some sort of like yes but feeling. I don't know, is that is the sense of inherently existent self fading? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll, unless unless someone's mean to you, then it comes back. Yeah, go ahead. I was I was thinking like if the mind stream that is currently grasping at this self labeled J mm -hmm. um, goes on, you know, and takes a rebirth in a different body, and that 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 it will probably still have this habit of grasping at a self mm. that self will be like a total stranger to like, I probably, you know, I wouldn't even, they'd be just as much a stranger to me as the person at the grocery store. I never met. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that's not to say that we don't like trend a certain way, right? Like if you, have a habit of anger that you came in with this life. You were a really impatient child. You were really grumpy. You know, you stamped on the ants. <clears throat> you know, you were just a little grumpy bugger when you were little. 
it might be that the conditions of your life helped soothe that and you eventually became more patient or the conditions of your life reinforced that and you got even more grumpy, even more angry and irritable and your next life you're coming in mad as hornets, you know? So it's not like there's no relationship between past and future, you know, you, but it, think more in terms of consciousness that's always moving. So, you know, like take the river analogy, maybe the river is carrying a large amount of debris, that debris, some of it will be purified or, you know, sort of left on the banks, and some of it will be carried to the next part of the river. You know, so some is left behind, some is carried with, some new things are added. So if we met our past self, maybe we would understand our current conditions better. You know, and then it becomes the question of what is the legacy I want to leave my future self? Because our past self gave us a very kind inheritance of a human body and a human life and access to teachings and a connection with ethics. That was an incredible inheritance. But they also, we might have inherited certain habits that we'd like to leave on the banks, you know, whatever, you know, we all have them. Yeah. So all that can be true without there being a core. And that's what's kind of unsettling. Yeah. And it is a little unsettling. And the closer you get to realizing the emptiness of an inherently existent self, the more groundless you start to feel. You're like, I'm making decisions, but do I have free will? I am sitting here, but where am I? <laughs> you know, and you start, you can start getting quite unsettled. And they say that if you're generally speaking, pretty mentally sound, and you start to have like a fear of annihilation, that's a good sign. Don't be afraid, just lean into the fear and see what happens. Now, if you're already a little bit having trouble with convention and mental health, and, you know, in a way that's really obviously disruptive to your life, it might be too soon for that meditation. But, you know, most of us were, were grounded enough that I think we could treat it as a really interesting thought experiment. And when the fear of who is the self, what am I, I'm going into nothing, just lean in and see, because you're not going into non-existence. You're leaning into the reality, which is interdependence, which then is a great relief. Imagine the relief in your mind if you no longer had to, I guess, hold a reputation <laughs> or worry about what people thought or worried about having ambitions or worried about this and that protecting this and saving that and if your identity just kind of chilled out yeah then it starts to feel like you're just kind of changing clothes when you die you know you're changing bodies like you're changing clothes and you're like oh look at this one oh, look at that oh, oh weird wonky pinky on that hand that's funny you know just like if you're wearing funny shoes and they had a color change effect you know you're just like oh that's weird but you know it's just a bag of bones and now your consciousness has entered this bag of bones and is having this kind of an experience and so you're just kind of doing the best you can with the conditions without over identifying with any piece of the conditions yeah so then you can you know you can have a name <laughs> And you can have a gender or not a gender or a, you know, non-binary situation. You can have a race or not identify as your race. You can whatever, but it's gentle and it doesn't create otherness because that's the main thing. It's like you can land on any kind of identity thing without that creating a barrier that makes you feel suspicious of whatever is other. Yeah. You know, you can say, look, I have green eyes. And someone can say, no, you don't, they're hazel. You're not gonna like shake your fist and say, how dare you, <laughs> right? Yeah, you're going, ha, oh, yeah, must be the light or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah, so this one with separate from conversation, it, it's very interesting, but only if you're really up for making it personal. Right. It has to be really personal. And when you get to this ascertaining lack of separateness or difference, then you're approaching the conclusion, which is that there is no inherently existent self. And you already knew you were going there, but now you can land on it with some, some like flavor to it. You're finding the non-finding. Yeah. 
finding the non-finding. So any questions about those four before we do another reflection, which will then turn into a meditation? I do, Venerable. Sure, yeah, um, go ahead. Okay, on, on point three. Mm -hmm. So are we saying that, because my sense of self is based on identifying with the aggregates, my consciousness, all of my faculties, that's how I, that's how I form the container of self. But in point three, what we're saying is, is that that doesn't make us inherently existent. Like the aggregates don't make us inherently existent. Not that they're not a part of our experience or who we are conventionally. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. You can have these okay. experiences. You can have the labels for it. You can try and bring health to each area while still not thinking any of it is self-creating or self-perpetuating or existing okay. from its side like yeah. naturally you know meaning like causelessly you know right. that, and you know it's confronting the idea that you have a core self that you either need to get to and evolve or that you're gathering th gathering things to and evolving with but, but there feels like there's some sort of like little self person in amongst all your experiences and that is what is the illusion there's just simply not okay all right thank you thank you but there's still experience you know and there's still karma you know there's still a mental continuum upon which karma is placed you know even though all of your choices are interdependently made whoever was the final stop on the road to the decision gets there you know that karmic seed plunk right and everyone along the way making choices plunking on their continuums experiencing those things yeah but do you see the way it changes your daily life experience if you think some attribute you know say it's i have a good sense of humor and people like me that is a core piece of my identity now if you're landing on that lightly as only in a certain context and only because i learned it then if people disagree, you don't feel threatened, right? But if you're holding to that as inherently true or inherently you, a disagreement feels like a threat. Yeah. Right, and that's the real issue is because then we're getting further away from the truth of our true nature as far as Buddha nature and then not understanding emptiness, the yeah. dependent arising of things. Yeah. 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 And okay. yeah, and you know, and dependent arising and emptiness are not the same thing, but dependent arising points you to emptiness. Dependent arising is the reason why things are empty. So it's your gateway right. of your access point. Yeah. So we have the mother and then the father of the potentiality. Yeah, the, the, the father's the object, the brother's the dependent arising. We got all sorts of analogies floating around, but if it makes sense to you, basically it's just ways to not have the self be such a weapon anymore yes okay. yeah, or such a like sponge of neediness and sense of deprivation depending on your personality right yes okay thank you yeah. so I'm, I'm gonna just read you a little bit about those last two points from geshe nawan darge in his book teachings from tibet and then we're gonna shift into a meditation so we'll do a little reading reflection and then shift so if you just get yourself back into good posture and again read or don't read as your preferences dictate and again this is from uh, teachings from tibet and the chapter in search for the self by geshe nawan darge and this is available free online um, from Lama Yeshi Wisdom Archive if anybody wants it. It's a really excellent publication. Okay, so Geshe says, the third key is ascertaining the absence of true sameness of the I and the five aggregates. Once we have ascertained the object of refutation by meditating on emptiness, and seeing how it cannot exist in a way other than as one with the five aggregates or separate from them, we concentrate on whether or not the self-existent I can exist as one with the five aggregates. It 
if the i is the same as the aggregates, then because there are five aggregates, there must be five continuums of the i. Or because the i is one, the five aggregates must be an indivisible whole. We therefore examine each aggregate to see if it is the same as the self. We ask, are myself and my body the same? Are myself and my feelings the same? Are myself and my discriminating awareness the same? And so forth. There are many different analytical procedures to show that the concept of self as one with the psychophysical aggregates is wrong. I can deal with them only briefly here. For example, if the self were a permanent entity, as self-existence implies, destroying it would be impossible. Then, if the I were the same as the body, the body could never die, and the corpse could never be burned, because this would destroy the self. This is obviously nonsensical. Also, the mind and body would be unchanging because that is the nature of a substantial self. Furthermore, if there were a self-existent I identical with the body and mind, would be one indistinguishable entity and the individual designations of my body and my mind would be incorrect. Thus there are many different ways we can reason and meditate upon to arrive at the conclusion that reality and our habitual way of perceiving things are completely different. We are not fixed, permanent entities. And so just sit with that lack of oneness or sameness of I and the aggregates. Is there any way that that could be the relationship? Inherent self, identical, same as, components. See if you can feel your way into the absurdity that it just can't be that way.
if there is an inherently existent self, it can't exist as the same thing as components or one with each one of them. It would mean there were many selves, a self for each aggregate, or that there couldn't be multiple aggregates. It's just all one glunk self. And neither of those makes sense. And so then the fourth essential point, having ascertained as above that the self and the aggregates are not a true unity, we then consider whether or not our self-existent I is different from and unrelated to the aggregates. This is the fourth key, ascertaining the absence of any true difference between self and the aggregates. For example, if you have a sheep, a goat, and an ox, you can find the ox by taking away the sheep and the goat. Similarly, if the eye existed separately from the body and the mind, then when we eliminated the body and the mind, we would be left with a third entity to represent the eye. But when we search outside of our body, feelings, consciousness, and so forth, we come up with nothing. Generations of yogis have found that there is nothing to be found beyond the aggregates. Once more, there are many different ways to reason in contemplating the possibility that the self is separate from the aggregates. If they were truly different, there would be no connection between them. If we said, for example, my head aches, the my would refer to something other than the head, the form aggregate, and ache, the feeling aggregate. It would be something that existed somewhere else. The aggregate would hurt, not me. If the self were truly a different thing, a true polarity apart from the aggregates, it would be absurd to say my head hurts, my hand hurts, and so forth, as though the pain somehow affected the self. By performing different kinds of analysis, we cultivate the certainty that the self and the aggregates are not truly different. And so just stay with that point, ascertaining the lack of separateness or difference of the eye and the aggregates. But it just doesn't make sense. Some little autonomous boss, unrelated to body, unrelated to mind, or magically in charge of them both but with no relation to or effect from them.
and as you come to that absurdity that it just can't be that way, see if you can fall into that space of infinite possibility. Finding your own mother, the womb-like expanse, finding the non-finding of inherent self. See if that can turn into seeing the emptiness of inherently existent self. And we can say verse 12, 12, things exist, but not in this way, of stark facts rendered in dichotomies. For the inseparable bond of our loving parents is more one of tenderness and joy. Okay. So that process is depending on your translator called the fourfold analysis, the four keys, the four point analysis. There's a few different names for it, but um, basically you know that it's going in the right direction when it's starting with that finding the object of negation. Um, you can go into a more detailed version, which is called the reasoning of the diamond slivers which is quite an interesting unpacking of that same sequence. And a really good book that explores that is called Meditation on Emptiness by Jeffrey Hopkins. Um, but it, you know, it's pretty heady, so make sure you've got plenty of mental space before you dig in. Um, but really any one of those points can be its own meditation, or you can skip to the end if you know that it's important to have thought about the others beforehand. You know, if, if you're feeling praised or offended, if you're feeling, I don't know, drawn to or averse from, if you're feeling that strong push and pull that is the symptom of self-grasping ignorance, if you can land back on finding the non-finding, that self that feels so celebrated, so threatened, so this or so that, that self is the very one that's not there. The one that is there is merely labeled on the collection and it's not separately reactive, <laughs> right? There can be feelings having feelings and discrimination having discrimination and all of it interwoven with one another and slap a label there. But that feeling of additional component of holder or owner or boss or somehow a ride along on top of the other aggregates just can't be the case. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you stuck on any of the points or are you intrigued by any of the points and you want to look at more? That uh, process is related mostly to verses 9 and 10 in the root text. So the rest of the text is very much about recognizing your mother via Mahamudra meditation. So when you hear the word Mahamudra or Dzogchen, um, depending on which tradition you're accessing it from, what's being spoken about is kind of cutting to the subtlest form of looking at the aggregates, which is straight to consciousness. So you're using consciousness as your object to see that it's empty. Because if we're doing really well with moving through identification, usually what we land on is, okay, Self is not body, self is not feeling, self is not discrimination, self is not, self is not, but it is the mind, <laughs> right? That's usually where we get stuck is thinking, well, surely though, at least the self must be the mind. 
Yeah. So for Mahamudra meditation, you kind of go straight there. You cut straight to the chase and you take the mind and see that it's empty of inherent existence, which means you had two kind of projects before you got to the cushion, right? Or two different cushion projects before you brought them together. So your scholarly project was looking at emptiness. Yeah. In relation to any number of things, right? In relation to you, others, instances of, I don't know, this was very important or this was completely insignificant or whatever, you know, big, strong labels you've been using as your object, but you need to think about emptiness. And studying the philosophical tenant schools is really useful. So that's one project, right? Just getting the correct philosophical view, even if it's just intellectual, even if you've had no experience, just a solid intellectual understanding that all phenomena are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. You just have that king of reasons solid enough that it makes some kind of sense to you. Yeah, project one. Project two is you've identified the mind, right? You've been, you've been able to do some form of clarity of mind meditation, some form of sky, not the clouds, where you're able to see that mental factors and main minds function slightly differently. And that the main minds have a more kind of reflective, less judgmental, less opinionated aspect, that the mental factors have more movement and decisions and choices and, you know, things to say, they're the chatty ones, right? And this is why we do that basic meditation of pretend that the mind is sky-like and spacious, think of the thoughts like clouds coming and going, try not to be obsessed with the weather, keep touching the sky, not the clouds. You know, that beautiful basic meditation you maybe did as a baby, baby Buddhist, it's useful for just not being too emotional. It's useful for just settling down, but it's also a very key portion of coming to be able to do Mahamudra meditation. Yeah, because if you can kind of sit with, there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of distractions, and there's also something else simultaneously. There's a reflective aspect to the mind, yeah, that's got real clarity and real absence of agitation simultaneous with all the movement, yeah? And if you can then take that and kind of notice the way in which it can feel like kind of the self or an observer of the self or an observer of the activities of the self, the way it starts to concretize when you look at it. Then you bring in your philosophical understanding of emptiness to free it back up again. And that's a you know, huge oversimplification of Mahamudra meditation. But when you bring it to the end of the day, that's really what it is, is using the mind as the object of your analysis of emptiness, such that your analysis eventually relaxes into experience. Yeah. So some analytical meditations, you'll find like you have to think, right? You have to think on purpose. You have to dig deep. But if you think deeply analytically, sometimes you touch it, right? You get a sense of it, like take something accessible like love, okay? So we knew about love before we were Buddhist. We knew about love before we meditated, right? But we did some study and we realized love is wishing all sentient beings to have happiness. Not that you're like the grand magic happiness giver, but in an aspirational, may all beings be well, may they all be happy, right? Unconditional, clean, clear, love. So it's an intellectual exercise, but then you have an experiential relationship, don't you? You've been loved, you've loved others, right? Sometimes it's been tidy, sometimes it's been messy, but you get it about love. So then you meditate and your analysis then triggers an experience or like a resonance where you no longer need words to touch it. Do you know what I mean? Like you've talked yourself into an experience of it and now you can release the words and just abide. Yeah. So a similar sort of thing is going to happen in a Mahamudra meditation where it takes a great deal of intellectual conceptualization and really thinking things over and then an experience of having touched the mind in some way 
and then bringing those together in such a way that there's like a resonance of when you see mind, you know emptiness. Yeah, you with me in theory? Yeah. So it's an interesting process and that's, that's what the other uh, verses are kind of pointing us to. So verses 15 and 16, likewise, many scholars and meditators amid Sakya, Nyingma, Karma, Drupa pride themselves on their diverse terminology, reflexive awareness, subject free, empty and luminous, primordial purity and spontaneity, Samata Bhadra's true face, Mahamudra, the uncontrived innate nature, neither is nor is not, devoid of any standpoint. This is all splendid if the target is hit, but I wonder what you are all pointing at. So it's a little bit of a gentle critique that sometimes Sometimes scholars will overcomplicate what it is we're meditating on. And sometimes that very diverse term terminology can be very useful to land on the point. But what the author here to, you know, is saying is that if we don't hit the target, um, it's not so splendid. But yeah. Then verse 19, since the innate nature can dawn, through even contrived meditation, right? Through even contrived meditation. So even fabricated, even made up, even fake it till you make it. This innate nature of lack of inherently existent mind, it can dawn even through just our clumsy attempts of thinking our way to it. Therefore, you elderly meditators need not be insistent since one can uphold the absence of elaboration of existence and non-existence you stubborn logicians need not fret. Yeah. So it's basically saying, you know, you guys who've been meditating a long, long time and haven't had a great deal of success, or you people who are only scholars and logicians who have been just kind of thinking yourself into circles, neither of you need to worry because this innate nature can dawn even through our clumsy attempts at meditation, even totally contrived. You just have to keep at it, but not in this like insistent, tight, punishing way, more as an exploration with kind of childlike curiosity. Verse 20 says, this may have all evolved from not knowing the proper use of conventions. By some wanting in erudition, I mean no disrespect. Do forgive me if I cause offense. So, you know, it's saying basically we came by it honest that we kind of get into over elaborations and that we overcomplicate things. And we wanna explain things that are in some ways beyond words, but the author is saying, you know, it's understandable that this has happened. I don't mean to offend you, but I do need to say not all parts of this can be contained by language. Yeah, you know what I mean? So it's, it's kind of like we do the best we can with words to say, here's what to do, step, step, step. But at the end of the day, it's something that goes beyond words. And we're just using the words as like scaffolding to get us there. Yeah. Yeah, any, so Mahamudra thoughts, Mahamudra questions? And remember, this is just an introduction to the text, right? So Jada Rimshe is going to come and unpack it for y'all at some point this year, hopefully. Um, but if you have any kind of immediate thoughts, I can have a go. Yeah, go ahead. How do the preliminary practices like play in here in preparing for, to do Maha Mudra? Say that again. How do you like... Um, doing preliminary practices yeah like is that part of preparing to do maha mudra yeah it is and sometimes the way in which it is is not totally obvious right you're like how is doing lots and lots of water bowls and lots and lots of vajrasattva going to help me understand the fundamental nature of the mind <laughs> right pouring and you're like all right <laughs> yeah or like all right i'm doing my mantras right and what's happening is that our mind is actually 
very much wanting to understand its own nature. It has all the potential it needs, but it's so distracted. It's just so distracted and it's so chasing temporary satisfaction as opposed to ultimate satisfaction. It's like, we're just tracing these like crumbs of happiness, never going to the full cake because it's all we've ever known. It's understandable. And so what we need to do is kind of get ourselves to sit still for a second. Yeah, so that we can actually access the deep clarity that's already there and then grow from that place. You know, the, the natural clarity of the mind is not something we need to make or fabricate. It's already there, but it takes a lot of settling to touch it. And then once you've touched it to grow from that place or to bring your learning to that place. So when you're doing preliminary practices, like a whole bunch of Vajrasattva mantras to purify negative karma, or a whole bunch of water bowls to accumulate merit or mandala offerings, what you're doing is gathering momentum to see you through the hard parts of your meditation. So sometimes I think of it in terms of if you've planned for something that you're looking forward to for a really long time, that planning bears fruit, all of that planning energy, you know, so say it's like a magical holiday to Africa or something, and you've your whole life wanted to go to Africa, and you love elephants, and they're the best thing ever. And you've thought about it for so long, so many years. And you've saved money and saved money. And then you've researched good things to do and ethical things to do. And you've researched and researched. And finally, the money and the research and the time has all come together. Once you're actually there, you're going to really make the most of it. You know, you won't be in your hotel room in Africa going, you know what, today, I think I'm just going to sleep in. I'm just going to sleep all day. Just enjoy the motel room. Yeah, never mind. I spend tons of money and tons of effort. And I've wanted to do this my whole life. And I'm, you know, right. The elephants are right outside the door. I'm just going to sleep in today. You won't, will you? Because you have all of this momentum right? That's going to like, you're going to leap out of bed at, you know, 5am or 6am and like celebrate the dawn and, you know, sing the Lion King songs or whatever you're going to do, right? Because of what led up to it. So we all know that when you sit in meditation, it's hard enough to get yourself to sit, right? Like, isn't it, even if you like meditating, even if you want to meditate, you might circle your cushion a few times before you actually get your bum onto it, even if you like it. <laughs> right? Let alone on days you don't like it. Once you're on the cushion, knowing what to do takes a great deal of time, but you finally know what to do. You finally sat down. Now you're finally doing it, but you haven't brought enough mental momentum. What's going to happen is that something interesting is going to occur to you about a family drama or a friendship issue or a relationship dynamic or a workplace thing. And you're just going to say, well, now that I'm sitting still, let me just brainstorm that strategy for work tomorrow. Yeah, no, I'm sitting still. Let me just do this worldly thing that I've been meaning to think about instead of my meditation. Yeah? Or why don't I daydream about all the things that are possible or go through the greatest hits of my favorite memories or my greatest shames and hopes and fears? You know, you're just going to like devolve into entertaining yourself with mental drama unless you have enough mental momentum by the time you sit down. And if you sit down with the right amount of mental momentum, we call it merit, then you can hold your seat and keep going. Yeah, when it's enjoyable, when it's boring, when it's confusing, when it's clear, you have this like discipline, but also forward moving mental energy that keeps you step by step in your meditation and the flow state can be engaged. So all the preliminary practices, it's like all of your planning for your holiday, all your money saving for the holiday, it's all of that store of energy so that when you finally sit, it has the potential to work. Does that make sense? Yeah, like that. So it can seem unrelated. And I, you know, you're like, what? Why am I doing this? This has nothing to do with that. But it, it actually can really, 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 really help. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, other Mahamudra thoughts or questions? Or anything peripheral about the text? Yeah. 
Is that Ali? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's Ali. Hi. I just wanted to say I really uh, liked the analogy that you made about like the trip to Africa and comparing like this momentum to merit and to, you know, water bowls and saying Vajrasattva mantras that like we're building up the momentum. Like I've never even thought of it that way. Um, so it's really interesting, but it, it, it really makes sense when you talk about it that way. Yeah, good. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's important we have this conversation because otherwise you feel like you're doing it because it's the right thing to do or because of some tradition or you're just like going on faith that it's going to be useful. But if it has some sort of psychological reasoning, that helps us because that's how we were brought up to understand life is science and psychology and things like this. So if you can bring in all the levels, it'll help. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I thought maybe we would just do a little short um, Lama Yeshi reading, kind of sh um, change gears, because Lama Yeshi speaks so much in terms of uh, experiential and less scholarly. Um, and he has this really interesting section in his Mahamudra book called Meditation Doesn't Negate. Right, so what is true conventionally isn't suddenly not true conventionally just because you've had a powerful meditation on emptiness but you know kind of playing with conventional and relative is something that we need to start getting familiar with if we want to do this kind of mahamudra flow state um, another good book just to tap into it is buddhism one teacher many traditions um, particularly the conventional mind section it's really easy to get confused if you've been to a lot of different Dharma centers and heard terminology from a lot of different places. Um, this book helps explain from the Pali tradition, they frame it this way, from the Sanskrit tradition that way. Um, and so this is a really good resource. Um, so anyway, just having those up, just so you know. So we're gonna look at a little Lama Yeshi and then we're gonna do a baby Mahamudra meditation. Okay, so do you want to do a baby Mahamudra meditation and then dedicate finish? Okay, so Lama Yeshi, Mahamudra, baby visualization, then done. Yeah. Okay, so back into a posture that feels stable. Nice straight back, letting go of any tension. So Lama Yeshi says, when you meditate, you can reach a point where you have an experience of the non-existence of the self objectively and subjectively. But if you can misinterpret this experience, you can easily get the impression that therefore there is no I, no good, no bad, no samsara, no nirvana, no cause and effect. In your daily life, you're so wrapped up in the relative mind, the grosser levels of mind, the conventional mind, that just naturally you think that everything is really existing. Like in the supermarket, all those existed things. And in meditation, this egocentric eye gets a taste of the non-existence of itself. And you have an emptiness experience, no conventions, no nirvana, no samsara. You can easily become nihilistic because of this meditation experience. You think it contradicts relative reality and therefore nothing exists. But having the experience of non-duality in your meditation doesn't mean that conventionally there is no self or anything else. There is. Cause and effect do exist. The Four Noble Truths do exist. When you stop your meditation and open your eyes, again, you use your conventional mind. And again, everything is there. But the relative I and relative phenomena are the truth only for the relative mind. They are valid only conventionally. The self and everything else is an interdependent phenomena appearing like a dream, an illusion, but nevertheless functioning in its own way. So don't be confused by this and don't be afraid of it. 
don't confuse the conventional and the ultimate. These two worlds do not contradict each other, even though you might think that they do. Anyway, the relative I and relative phenomena are already existing within non-duality space, remember? They're not separate from it. They already have the no-self character, the non-duality character, the inborn nature of non-duality, of selflessness. That is their original character. They've always had this. Remember, even though we might comprehend this intellectually, that the self and all phenomena are in the nature of no self existence, everything we experience through our senses and our mental consciousness still seems to exist as it appears to us, dualistically. One moment we open our eyes, we perceive everything, including our own self, dualistically. Panchen Lama tells us that eventually, having familiarized ourselves in our Mahamudra meditation again and again, as we've described, whatever you investigate in great detail, the way any object of the six types of consciousness appears, the way it exists will dawn nakedly, vividly. Then he says, in brief, do not grasp at the inherent existence of whatever objects appear, such as your mind and so on, and always sustain with certainty the way they exist. With such understanding, all phenomena in samsara and nirvana are united in a single essence. You see, Mahamudra describes the universal reality of all existent phenomena, not just the self. But in the beginning, it's not important to describe the non-self existence of external things. First, we need to experience it in relation to ourself. We need to eliminate the concept of ego, this unrealistic entity that has never existed in the past, doesn't exist now and will never exist in the future. Once we've achieved that realization, experiencing the emptiness of everything else is easy. Having discovered the non-duality of our own self, we will discover the non-duality of the entire universe. Arya Davis says, whoever sees one entity, sees all entities. Whatever is the emptiness of one, is the emptiness of all. And so then release your analytical mind as much as you can and start by just coming into contact with the mind itself. The mental factors like clouds in the sky will continue to be intriguing, will continue to move and change, but they're not your interest right now. See if you can touch that vast clarity and reflectiveness as if behind or above all the other activity. Rest in the nature of mind.
Try not to react to your own thoughts. Let them roll through like weather. Keep coming back to the clarity. And you're not pushing away thoughts or pulling them or getting stuck in them. Just letting them be. Let them be and roll through. They're not your main interest. See if you can touch that main mental mind, that primary consciousness. less movement, less opinions, spacious, but not spacey, relaxed, but not vague, reflective. And as you observe the mind with less or no interest in the thoughts, see if you can color that observation with the fact that you know the mind itself is empty of inherent existence. See if you can imbue it with that knowing with little or no analysis, just riding the wave of what you've learned before. This mind is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. So you keep watching the mind while knowing that.
And from emptiness arises Shakyamuni Buddha, golden in color. Connect with him as the embodiment and representative of your own outer and inner refuge. From emptiness arises the Buddha. and visualize Prajnaparamita at the heart of Shakyamuni Buddha. Connect with her as the embodiment and representative of outer and our own developing inner wisdom. At her heart is the syllable ah. Surrounding this is the Heart Sutra Mantra. Tayata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasamgate Bodhisoha. It holds within it the procedure for realizing emptiness directly. And then we recite the mantra. And as we do so, visualize infinite light emanates from the mantra. Imagine oneself and all other sentient beings gaining a realization of emptiness, cutting the root of samsara. gate gate. Paragate, parasamgate, bodhisoha. Taihata, gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate. Bodhisattva, Tayata, Gate Gate, Arai Gate, Parasam Gate, Bodhisattva, Tayata, Gate Gate, Arai Gate, Parasam Gate, Bodhisattva. Tayata, Gate Gate, Arai Gate. Parasamgate Bodhisattva Tayata Gate Gate Paragate Parasamgate 
And the mantra dissolves and absorbs into Prajna Paramita, who dissolves and absorbs into Shakyamuni Buddha, who dissolves and absorbs into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind. And we dedicate. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. The wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel source of every single benefit and happiness in this world. The incomparably kind, supreme Tenzin Gatso, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. <laughs> Chua sum kua wei vei mon tua dro. Ha ha da sua du jay guan du shop ten shu. And you can relax your attention. Okay. So are there any um, just immediate questions that you wanna get off your chest before we call it a night? Enough to digest for now? Well, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your patience and your participation and presence, all the P's. So thank you very much. And it's nice to be able to do this topic with folks. And thanks to the Citizen uh, oh. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Yun Chen. Thank you, Venerable. Thank you, Venerable Yun Chen. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Yun Chen. Thank you, Venerable Yun Chen. Thanks, guys. And thanks to Land of Medicine Buddha. Thank you.